hello, I'm V.B. Price. I'm the editor of NewMexicoMercury.com. I'm here today on Insight New Mexico in the Mercury Library with essayist, professor, a longtime educator, uh, Manuel Corso, who's written some marvelous uh, pieces for the Mercury recently on uh, educational reform in our state. Uh, he's working on a new book called Belief Systems and the Social Contract. His pieces, if if you've read them, and I assure you have, are very biting and wonderfully lucid, and I'm really grateful to have him here with us today, and I look forward to a wonderful half hour of, con of conversation. I'm glad to be here, and I hope I live up to your expectations. So in the first piece, I think, for the Mercury, uh, you wrote a piece called uh, The Scandera Loop, which I thought was a, just a wonderful piece of work. Uh, maybe you could begin our interview uh, in the... Um, uh, in, in a kind of a general view of, of um, what's happening with education reform in New Mexico today. Okay, well, I think what's going on, frankly, is a scam. Uh, in fact, <clears throat> I think I at one time referred to um, the, uh, this lady as Scam Dara because she has absolutely no qualifications for the position she holds. She makes a lot of money and has been making a lot of money at New Mexico taxpayer expense to do things which are not really um, intended to make New Mexico public education better, but to make it, um, let's say, saleable to the people who have contributed so much money to the political campaigns here, like the Koch brothers and the and Rupert Murdoch and people like that, who uh, are just salivating over getting public education into their hands, and I I see Miss Scandera as an agent of that uh, strategy, and she uh, has engaged in what you know. Um, actions, activities, things of that nature, um, to uh, increase her power. Uh, for instance, right now, as in a good example, she was before uh, a legislative committee arguing that uh, the uh, New Mexico Department of Education should control school budgets. Well, <laughs> of course, if you control school budgets, you've got them. Yeah. And you can say, well, you know, yeah, you'll have to concede uh, on this issue and we'll give you some money. I, it's so, it, to me, it's so blatant that it, uh, I don't even know how, how somebody can get up in the morning and face the public or face a, a legislative committee and honestly say, oh, yeah, I'm in this for the education aspect of it. You're not. You're, you came here from Jeb Bush's failed presidential campaign. You came here from his group of close advisors. You were recommended to Martinez by her, and I, and I use the word, I think properly, her investors, um, who invested in her her uh, first uh, campaign for governor, and and no doubt invested in in the second one. Um, <clears throat> she you you do not meet the minimum standards that are spelled out for holding the position of secretary of education. You just doesn't she does not meet those standards. So, if you don't meet the standards, why are you here? What are you doing here? What's you know? What forces are in place that are keeping you here, doing what you're doing, which is not improving education? You're maneuvering for power, and that's exactly what's been going on: is this maneuvering for power, pushing teachers aside, uh, wanting teacher evaluation, uh, promoting this antediluvian uh, third grade retention business, which is so completely off the track, so completely contrary to the principles of good educational practice. They did that when I was in grade school. You know, that's like 70 years ago people were doing it and it didn't work then. So why do you think it's going to work now? You know, 
every child, every child, you even, and me even, we all learn at our own rates. And those rates are not uh, etched in stone. They're not valedictory. They are us as a person. Why should a child have to learn by the time they're in third grade? What's the rationale for that? What if they wanted to learn to read in second grade? Would you say, sorry, you're going to have to wait till next year and then you'll learn, because third grade's the year you're going to have to learn how to read? And then, <laughs> so, and, and what's the problem with learning to read in fourth grade? Nothing at all. So, if you look at all of the edicts that, and, and public statements and public postures that have come out of the Martinez administration via Ms. Scamdera, you'll see that there is no educational policy there. But I want to ask you, if you could, just for our viewers mm -hmm. and our listeners, to, to describe what the, what the proposals have been uh, so far okay. from, from uh, uh, the Martinez administration, and what they are, if we can summarize it, what they are designed to replace. First of all, they want to control school budgets. Okay. And right now, public schools and public school districts control their own budgets. Okay. They're allocated a certain amount of money. They know what they need. They know what the, the, the schools need. They have their own recommendations, and they disperse the money within the school system according to that need. Who in Santa Fe knows what somebody in Roswell needs? Exactly. And are they going to say, well, no, you don't need that, so you can't have that amount of money. Excuse me, uh, how do you know that? Right. Well, or they could say, and that really what they're saying is, you're going to go along with our program and we'll give you the money you need. And if you don't go along with the program, too bad. You know, and, and they don't, they're don't they not that blatant about it, but that's basically the message. The other is this control of third grade retention business, which is so spurious. I mean, that, that's just a crock, third grade retention, as though it's some big educational policy issue. Right. It's not even worth talking about, except that they've made an issue of it. Teacher evaluation. Um, well, let me ask you a just a, a question, you know, would you want to be responsible for if we just picked some individual off the street and said, okay, we're going to, we're going to teach this guy how to do differential equations. You want to be responsible for that? <laughs> no, of so. course not. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> of course not. So <clears throat> every child learns at a rate particular to that child. That issue is completely left out of this equation. So you have this horde of Republicans who are so happy to go along with this kind of stuff because, you know, Republicans are more group-minded people than Democrats. Democrats are like herding cats, and Republicans just love to go along with whatever the group program is. So you have this photograph in the newspaper of all these Republicans just so happy they're standing behind their their Secretary of Education and their State governor and where, you know, they're <laughs> that's the group. Um, and how many of them are educators? Okay, how many of those guys and ladies our educators who are championing these educational policies. How many professional educators are advising this program? None. Huh? Zero, as far as I can tell. I haven't seen uh, a name or a set of credentials that would give anybody credibility for advising on these matters. It's political. It's, it's absolutely political, and it has to do with ambition more and profit. Those are the two motives for these policies that are being, that are coming out of Santa Fe now. So what we're really talking about is the privatization of education. I kind of look at, uh, at uh, certain kinds of privatizers who are looking to go into uh, the public coffers as looking at legislators like mining claims. You know, we're going to go in and we're going to get every single thing we can and there's no accountability, there's no nothing. Uh, so could we talk a little bit about 
privatization in this oh, sure. in this aspect? Miss Scandera, um, in the first year or two that she was here in New Mexico, attended a big conference out in California. And one of the speakers, she spoke, and one of the speakers at that conference was Rupert Murdoch. And he happily declares the education market in the United States is a $500 billion market. Well, of course, you know, Rupert's going to salivate over $500 billion <laughs> and, <laughs> because that's what motivates him. And he didn't say one word about improving education. All he was talking about was making money. <laughs> so with that kind of money at stake, it stands to reason that you're going to have a lot of people wanting in because, I mean, even what's Rupert going to do with four, $500 billion? I mean, He's got to share it a little bit with his friends. <laughs> I mean, there's enough to go around. So, you know, the cock boys want their share, and they donate to politicians all over the country with similar agendas. And um, so who, who then become the victims of this almost military campaign? And it's children, they're the victims, teachers, and teachers are not well known uh, for being political activists. True. That's not, the, I mean, I taught enough teachers when I was at Wisconsin to know that people who go into teaching are not militants. They just like kids, <laughs> they like teaching. Yeah. And um, so those are, you know, and then, Imagine the huge public investment in the, just the physical plant of public education. True. It's enormous. It's absolutely enormous. What's going to happen to that when Rupert and his friends take over? Yeah, exactly. Well, they're good capitalists. They love taking over your infrastructure for free. It didn't cost them anything except a few donations to people's political ambitions. You know, that's chump change to them. True. You know, I think the the, the Koch brothers just recently um, announced that they were going to make $980 million available in the next political, over the next several years in political contributions. And, you know, and I look at that number and I go, boy, man, that's a lot of money. That's chump change for them. They don't, you know, because they're, because they're looking at ROI, return on investment. Right, right, right. You know, anything they do, they're looking at the ROI. And if they think that a $980 million investment is going gonna, is gonna to have a suitable return, you're looking at an enormous payback. If you have a, a relatively, uh, well, at least a present teacher's union, uh, and you, and you're in a state that is now uh, gearing up to become a right-to-work state. Uh, this seems to me to be a, a kind of a, of a happy marriage, if you will, oh, or, sure. between privatization and uh, and union busting. That, that whole union business is an interesting question, because <clears throat> I mean, from Wisconsin to New Mexico and everywhere else, you're seeing these uh, attempts to to pass right to work. Okay, on the face of it, right to work sounds pretty good, and you know because people should have a right to earn a living. Yeah. Um, but it's not about that. It's about union busting. Yeah. Teachers unions, carpenters unions. You know, I've been a member of two unions, the Carpenters and Joiners Union in, in Madison, Wisconsin, and uh, the uh, Theatrical Workers Union here in New Mexico. So I've been a union member for more than 20 years, uh, and I was a, a member of the Carpenters Union when I was teaching at Wisconsin. On my days off, I used to frame houses. <laughs> yeah. And um, what the right to work business is about is destroying unions. Now, you have to wonder about that, uh, I think, because in 19, late 1950s, um, something like 38%, somewhere in that neighborhood, I think 38% of American 
workers in private industry were unionized. Right. Today, it's a little less than 3.8%. So what are they going after? See, I've been asking too. Yeah, I mean, you know, they're using atomic weapons against tiny targets. Right. So why are they so afraid of organized labor? When organized labor has essentially been neutralized politically, they, they couldn't make a, a in, in Wisconsin when when Walker was first elected, um, there were union members who openly were voting for Walker who was anti-union. Yeah, go figure. So figure that one out, yeah. right? So why are unions such a threat to people? when they are essentially powerless and insignificant in terms of political clout. Sure, you can get uh, all the members of a local to vote for the candidate that somebody tells them they should vote for, but compared to the electorate, you're talking about a handful of people. You're not talking about some mass movement. Yet, the idea of organized labor just absolutely frightens Republicans. So it seems to me that the that um, one of the major obstacles to privatization is the teachers' union. Well, I don't know offhand what the percentage of public school teachers are unionized. I rather suspect that when you consider all the schools that exist across the United States in the townlets and hamlets and s small cities and large cities, I, I'm sure that organizing uh, organized teachers exist in large cities but i don't i don't think you're going to that given the the total number of people teaching school in the united states it's not that big a number yet they are it, the, <laughs> the biggest threat i think from public school teachers is that they happen to be intelligent people so let's talk about trojan horses uh, i love that piece of yours and and just for the people who didn't get a chance to read it could we enumerate again and sort of talk a little bit and explain what your view of these Trojan horses are and why they're being used the way they're being used. Well, they're a useful tool because when you're dealing with a large number of people who don't know the basic issues, don't understand basic issues, and I know I dwell on this third grade retention thing because it's a real bone for me. Yeah. <clears throat> Parents don't understand that third grade retention is a bogus issue. So they use things like that and school budgets and, and uh, other, other meaningless issues as a empty vessel to carry their ideas forward. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't want to seem totally paranoid, although I think I am somewhat paranoid at this point in time, because I see so many things things that indicate that we are moving toward, and, and, I, and I have to say too in my, in my own defense, that um, there, there are very strong efforts and trends and tendencies to control society more than it has been. You know, people live in this fantasy that, we, that this country is a democracy. And it's not a democracy. It's fast becoming a plutocracy, right. if it isn't already a plutocracy. And the problem with people like that, who are of that nature, is that there's never enough. Only more is more. So the Trojan horse idea really is that they use issues like education to carry forward an agenda that has nothing to do with teaching children. It has to do with a social agenda. It has to do with a financial agenda. It has to do with a national agenda. Well <clears throat> and all these folks who are uh, responsible for this, if you look at the list of all the corporations who don't pay any taxes in the United States, but who also receive subsidies from taxpayers, people like you and me, yeah. It's enormous. It We're supporting them. And they are shipping all the jobs overseas that used to pay well in this country. 
And then they are going, well, you know, unemployment is going down. Yeah, that's because people are so desperate. They're having to take jobs that don't pay anything in order to stay off the streets. And then you, and then you have the, the, the uh, entrenched unemployment where people just throw up their hands and give up. So what do you do? You, you have a draconian social policy to deny them food stamps, to deny them health care. I, I don't know where these people think the world is going to go because historically, I mean, if you go back to, you know, as far back in history as you want to go, civilization after civilization has gone through a very similar um, kind of turmoil. And always ended up badly. Always ended up badly. Mm -hmm. So, to me, the Trojan horse idea is that they use these kinds of issues to get in the gate. And then when they're in the gate, they do what they want to do. Well, I remember in your piece uh, that there were, uh, that you sort of put in the Trojan horse category. Uh, uh, no Child Left Behind and a core curriculum and even to a certain extent, uh, 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 charter schools, which aren't all bad. Uh, so I wonder if you could kind of sort of spin on that a little bit. Too. Okay, well, the, the charter school business is, is um, a good example here in New Mexico, I think. Here comes this guy, Paul Guessing, from somewhere out in the Midwest. The guy's never taught school. I, don't, I think he is a college graduate. I'm not sure, but I think he is a college graduate. And he comes here with a great job running this Rio Grande Foundation, I think is the name of his organization, and uh, promoting the idea of charter schools. Now, where did that come from? Did that just spring full-blown from the forehead of Zeus? He woke up one morning and Zeus spoke to him and he said, Paul Guessing, I want you to go forth and create charter schools. <laughs> you know, excuse me, uh, what do you know about education, Mr. Guessing? You're barely educated yourself. You know, so what, what is it that you are doing here in New Mexico with a great job promoting charter schools? Again, that's another form of Trojan horse. You bring in this empty individual and he promotes an empty agenda. And who suffers for it? Kids, parents, teachers. The teachers in, and the turnover of teachers in charter schools is very, very high. They seldom last, well, they have, many of them are finished after a year. They seldom go beyond two years. Not that there probably aren't some exceptions, but that's basically the numbers that I've read. The no child left behind thing is another scam, as far as I can tell. It's like the third grade reading business. You take, you take something that sounds good. So I, I don't much care for Arnie Duncan. I, I don't care for him at all. You know, that's, that guy is a lot of baloney there. And the fact that um, Barack Obama goes along with it tells me that he doesn't know any better either. Um, they're promoting these programs that are really weapons to destroy public schools. So having spent about 35 or so years or, or more in the classroom myself, I, you know, it's all, about, it's all about small classrooms, individual interaction, about allowing people who are, who are late, late bloomers to bloom, to bloom lately. Um, so I, I'm right there with you. Um, the, uh, we have just a few more minutes. I'm, I'm wondering if you have any just sort of any general wrap-up you'd like to make? Every child should be allowed to advance through the primary grades at a rate that is appropriate to them as an individual without prejudice. You might learn to read by second grade. It might take me to third grade to learn to read. It might take you um, to fourth grade to learn how to do some particular type of arithmetic or mathematics and I grasped it back in second grade. So what? So what? That hasn't anything to do with what school should be about. 
The school should be about you learning things at your rate, me learning things at my rate. If that's what we, if we want to educate children, that's how it has to be done. Without prejudice, without punishment, without uh, marking a kid for life. Oh, he, you know, you know, your 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 contemporaries go ahead of you. You're back here with all the second graders now, and you're older than they are. Do you think that's that's mortifying? Sure it is. That is absolutely demoralizing. Why would you punish a child for l not learning at a rate you pulled out of somewhere and said, oh, yeah, you should learn how to read by the time you're in third grade? Oh, really? Who, who Did Zeus say that? <laughs> all children should learn to read by the time they're in third grade. Boom! You know, there's a big flash of lightning and the clouds go, and you go, hey, what's that about? That's about control. It's not about children. And schools should be about children. So if we love our children, we want to see our children thrive, we want to see them learn, let teachers take care of it. Manuel, thank you so very, very much for being with us today. You know, it's, <laughs> it's a great thing for me and for, I think, our readers, too, to hear somebody who thinks about these things clearly in a way that we don't often hear about anymore. Yeah. And uh, as an as an old time teacher, I have to say I'm right there with you. So thank you, thank you very very much for being with us. Well, it's a pleasure. Thank you for for giving me a soapbox, <laughs> I suppose. And um, I, you know, these things are very important to me, and um, mostly because of my sense that our democracy depends on educated people.